Thank you for joining us today. We will begin in a few moments. For those of you just joining us, we will begin in a moment. Welcome, my name is Piper Chapman and I'm the Assistant Director at Harvard Alumni Travels. Thank you for joining us today for our travel talk, Seeing Stars, the Curious History of Celestial Maps and the Conquest of Mars, presented by Kelly O'Neill. Before I turn things over to our speaker, I'd like to review the format for today's Zoom webinar. For the duration of our one hour lecture, your microphone will be turned off so we can direct our attention to our speaker. On the bottom of your screen, you will see several buttons to interact with. Please insert your questions in the Q&A box. You will also see a chat box, which is intended for comments, sharing information, and to engage with fellow alumni. To chat the entire audience, please select everyone when submitting your comment. For those of you who would like to hide this chat feature, you may do so by moving the chat feed to the side of your screen. Should you have any technical issues, please message our support team by selecting HAA support in the chat. And as a reminder, this lecture will be recorded and shared with you. Finally, we appreciate your patience should we experience technological glitches or delays due to the nature of our virtual environment. Please be aware that you can also adjust your sound preferences on your personal devices. I invite you to acquaint yourself with your fellow Zoom attendees by sharing your name and location in the chat box. Thanks so much. I am so thrilled to pass this over to Kelly O'Neill, but first a brief word about our speaker. Kelly O'Neill is a historian of the Russian empire and an advocate of spatial history. She has taught undergraduate and graduate courses on czar's history, digital history, and the history of cartography. Her book, Claiming Crimea, a History of Catherine the Great's Southern Empire by Yale University Press in 2017 received an honorable mention for, for the Joseph Rothschild Prize in Nationalism and Ethnic Studies. She is the director of the Imperia Project at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard and recipient of the 2019 Digital Humanities Advancement Grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Kelly, thank you again for being with us today. I am so thrilled for this presentation and I would love to hand the mic over to you. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much, Piper. Um, I think that we are all set to go. I am um, thrilled to be here with everyone. Um, thank you for carving some time out of your day to come together and talk about maps and stars and planets. Um, as Paper said, I'm a historian and I study empires, the Russian Empire in particular. And I study maps and I, I make them too on occasion, but we'll, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, maps have come to be crucial to the way that I think about the past. And they're also quite crucial to the way that I live on a daily basis. And I'm relatively sure that the same is true for many of you, right? We consume maps or use them almost instinctively. When we're hungry, we eat. When we're thirsty, we drink. 
when we need to know where the nearest coffee shop is, we look on a map. Maps have become rather ubiquitous, right? They're useful, they are dangerous, they are anything but objective, right? They are incredibly complex graphic devices. They contain vast networks of data and they are culturally conditioned and they have deep histories. Unfortunately, I can't go into all of that today, right? But today I'm going to reduce the really rich history of maps and summarize it in a single statement, right? Which is always slightly dangerous and possibly irresponsible, but here it goes. Maps are powerful because they make spatial relations legible. Maps are made possible by the intimately connected processes of location and naming. Now, for the location part, happily, I can lean on Aristotle for backup. Um, Aristotle said all kinds of incredibly useful things in his time. For example, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. To perceive is to suffer. Right? No great mind has ever existed without a touch of madness. That is one of my personal favorites. Aristotle also said this, what is not is nowhere. Where, for instance, is a goat stag or sphinx? Now you might be thinking right away, what in the world is a goat stag? That would be a very understandable response um, to hearing this quote. Um, no one is entirely sure what it is. There are some interesting 18th century woodcut renderings of, of a goat stag. Um, the idea is that it, it does not exist, right? What is not is nowhere. Everything that is, is somewhere. In other words, location matters. Aristotle said so, right? Um, and if things are somewhere, my contention is that we humans need language to describe it. Yet yeah, we understand how coordinates work and are used to locate places, but coordinates are not sufficient on their own to express location in the way that we know it. To truly locate something, we must name it. We need place names. We need toponymy. Now, place names are uh, powerful, and it has often been said that to name a place is to claim it, to possess it. Now, this is an idea that's probably familiar to many of you. You only have to think of episodes um, from the so-called discovery of the new world, right? Or think of the aftermath of state collapse or regeneration in which places that once were claimed by imperial powers get renamed, their names are restored, regenerated. Think of Bombay, Mumbai, Leningrad, and St. Petersburg. To name something is to exercise power over it. That statement has a very nefarious ring to it, I realize. It isn't always the case. To name something can be a bit more innocuous. It can, be some, it can simply be a matter of expressing a connection, placing something in the universe of meaning. And that practice applies both on Earth and in an interplanetary space. Or does it? Well, let's talk about it. Um, since NASA happens to be conducting a mission to Mars, which launched in July, 2020, um, and the, the mission arrived on February, 2021, I thought we could use it as a test case for talking about this. Um, that is the Perseverance rover on the surface of the red planet. The rover landed here. It's the Yezera Crater. The Yezera Crater is 28 miles wide, and it's located on the western edge of a flat plain just north of the Martian equator. More than 3 billion years ago, scientists believed that river channels spilled over the crater wall and created a lake. And they see evidence that water carried minerals from the surrounding area into the lake, and conceivably, microbial life could have lived right here in the Yezera Crater. The Mars 2020 mission is studying how the region formed and evolved. It's seeking signs of past life, collecting samples of rock and soil that might preserve those signs. And all of that is amazing. But at some point it struck me, in order for NASA to land the rover, they needed to establish location, the location of the landing site. They also needed a way of talking about the location because calling it by its Martian coordinates and places on Mars do have coordinates um, would be very inefficient and unwieldy. 
it would also really reduce our ability to conceive of the relationships between places that exist on the Martian surface. So NASA scientists needed to invent the site as a place. They needed to imbue it with meaning. In other words, the crater had to be invented. It had to be named before Perseverance could land there. So what's the story of the crater? How was it named? How did it come to be named? That's the story that I want to explore with you today. Now, we'll need to wind the clock back a little bit to get a good answer. Um, more than a little bit, actually, because the story does go back to the Greeks and the Romans, at the very least, to the days when the fourth planet of the solar system became Mars. The fourth planet um, had been known as the red one to the Egyptians and the Babylonians, and it had been known as many other things to people, peoples around the globe. To the Greeks, it was known as Aries, and therefore to the Romans, it was known as Mars. In a way, really, the story goes back to this man. This is Claudius Ptolemy. He was an astronomer and a mathematician, and he is pictured here on your screen in a work called Ptolemy with an Armillary Sphere. It was produced in 1476, and it hangs in the Louvre in Paris. Now, the Armillary Sphere that he is holding in his left hand that was an instrument for demonstrating the movement of the celestial sphere around the earth. In other words, it was a geocentric model and therefore somewhat problematic, right? From our modern heliocentric perspective, but the armillary sphere is quite ingenious. It's a reference system for locating celestial bodies, stars in particular. And it could be used not just to model the heavens, but to measure things, to measure times of sunrise and sunset, the length of the day, etc. And there is Ptolemy with his armillary sphere. Um, he spent, you should know, an alarming portion of his life recording the coordinates of celestial bodies. He documented all then known constellations, and there were 48 of them known at the time. He composed a star catalog, which he had largely cribbed from the Babylonians, but he got credit for it. Um, and the star catalog included over a thousand distinct stars. Ptolemy recorded their ecliptic coordinates, their magnitude, and this is the fun bit. He included descriptions of the star's location within a known constellation. So in a nutshell, Ptolemy standardized the way the Western world viewed the heavens for a good 14 centuries. So I propose that we take advantage of his lasting influence and kind of ride the Ptolemy wave to the very beginning of the 17th century, when the history of star maps, celestial maps, gets really interesting. So we're moving from the Mediterranean to the North Sea, because in a different way, our story begins with this guy. Now, what is affectionately known, maybe just by me, as the pre-telescope era, came to a close in 1608, when Hans Lipperhey, a German Dutch spectacle maker, became the first to file for a patent for the invention of the telescope. Now the Dutch quickly adopted the telescope. Curiously, they kept their eyes trained on land. Very quickly, a man from Pisa called Galileo Galilei got wind of the invention. And within a year, he was studying not the land, but the heavens. And what followed was a scientific revolution. We can't go into all of that, but let's pick up one really important piece of it. The next two centuries are known as the golden age of uranographia. And who knows, that might be your word of the day or word of the week. Uranographia means celestial mapping, star cartography. It's the process of finding ingenious ways to represent the heavens on sheets of paper. Right? Galileo's contributions to observational astronomy include telescopic confirmation of the phases of Venus, observation of the four largest satellites of Jupiter, he observed Saturn's rings. In other words, by this moment, humans were not just seeing stars. They could now distinguish features of planets which is a different order of things. But this was the early 17th century, the age of star discovery, all other things. 
But by 1640, the catalog of known stars had expanded from 1,000 in the days of Ptolemy to roughly 3,000. This was an information revolution. This was big data, 17th century style, and it needed to be tamed, coded, standardized, possibly even shared. And this really was the project of uranographia, of star cartography. Star cartography had two fundamental elements. To do it well, you needed catalogs and you needed constellations. Now, we'll come back to the catalogs in a second, but first, I want you to think back to the moment you were introduced to the constellations, to the magic of seeing bears and dragons in the night sky, right? A constellation is nothing more and nothing less than a tool for bridging the metaphorical distance between the human mind and the heavens. Or in slightly more banal terms, a constellation is a tool for communicating what was known about the existence and location of the stars. Now, constellations have been in use since ancient times. There's nothing new about them in the 17th century. And we've talked about the fact that Ptolemy documented 48 of them. Laying them out in list form was something of a novelty, but humans have been finding ways to represent stars and constellations for millennia. It's possible that you've stumbled across, for example, the Nebra sky disk. This is a bronze disk about 12 inches in diameter that was discovered by looters in Germany in 1999. And it's thought by some to be the oldest star map in the world, dating back to roughly 1600 before the common era. Others argue that it is a bit younger than that um, and that it speaks of perhaps celestial phenomena but that it is no map, and there's a raging debate about this. Whether or not you believe that the history of celestial mapping begins here or even much earlier, the golden age of celestial mapping really does belong in this early 17th century moment. As one scholar has pointed out, the use of, not, so not only do we have the invention of the telescope, right, we also have the fact that print technology has been changing dramatically. So coarse woodblocks have given way to intaglio print processes. And thanks to these two technologies coming together, maps of the heavens could be both aesthetically pleasing and technically accurate. And map makers increasingly competed with each other to produce bigger and better star atlases. So if you wanna think about it this way, between 1600 and 1800, we have the equivalent of the competition between Elon Musk Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson, right? So let's have a look at the big three of star cartography. One of our competitors, one of the greatest car 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 celestial cartographers of all time was Johannes Hevelius. He was a Polish astronomer um, and became a celebrity throughout Europe in 1646, 1647 with the publication of his Selenographia or lunar map. It was presented not by him directly, but by some of his fans um, to Pope Innocent X, who declared, and I will quote the Pope, it would be a book without parallel had it not been written by a heretic. So it's kind of a grudging compliment coming from Innocent X. Um, Hevelius is, he's just an absolutely fascinating character um, in 17th century history. His observatory in Danzig, uh, Gdansk, was the best in Europe until the national observatories were established in Paris and in Greenwich in the 1670s. For, for, so for a while, he was the guy for astronomical observation in 17th century Europe. And the observatory instruments at what he called his star castle were mounted on a huge wooden platform that was built across multiple buildings on three adjoining houses. There was a museum, he built himself a library, a printing press, his own personal printing press where he could produce his own books. And he had a shop for making and repairing um, astronomical instruments. He was an engraver who was known for the beauty of his images. And here is his version of the constellation Bootis. Here, and you can see you know, the, the way that the constellation is used to hold the stars, right? Um, here is his map of the Northern Celestial Hemisphere. And it too is regarded um, as really quite beautiful. And, and I have to agree. And you, again, you can see here 
the dominant role that constellations are used as tools for organizing the stars, right? The stars themselves are not named, the constellations are named. Um, the stars, if you look closely at this image, you can see that the magnitude of stars is um, kind of symbolized by various symbols. But the stars almost play a secondary role in these star charts. A second big name, right, in star, star cartography was John Flamsteed. He was English and he was the son of a maltster, which means he was the son of a man who was in charge of making malt for brewing, which is fantastic. Um, he was in charge of building and running the observatory at Greenwich. Right? So he was a perfectionist and had a tendency to be somewhat irritable. This contributed to a rather unfortunate occurrence involving his star catalog because he didn't really like sharing his work. But because his star catalog was rumored to be the most accurate and the most comprehensive, he came under a lot of pressure from members of the Royal Society and particularly from two men named Edward Haley and Isaac Newton. Newton in particular needed accurate stellar positions to test some of his ideas about the moon's motion and about gravity. So Flamsteed finally succumbed to the pressure and sent the Royal Society a preliminary manuscript copy of his star catalog and gave them permission to publish some of the accompanying observations, but not the catalog. And in 1712, they published the catalog. They published this material as a complete catalog with not Flamsteed as the editor, but Edmund Haley. Um, Haley and Newton believed that they had a right to do this because the English government was in fact paying Flamsteed as a civil servant. And English ships were out there at sea being lost at sea due to inaccurate stellar positions um, that were compromising their ability to navigate. So Flamsteed, regardless, was furious and at what he saw as an egregious violation of his intellectual property. And he actually went to the trouble of collecting about 300 of the 400 copies um, that had been published and, and burning them. <laughs> Which brings us to star cartographer number three. Early into the 18th century, the last of the big names in the golden age of uranographia. Meet Johann Bode. He was the son of a Hamburg merchant. For a time, Bode was implied, employed as a calculator at the Berlin Academy of Sciences, but he would later go on to become a full-fledged member and he ran the Berlin Academy's observatory. In 1801, he published his great star atlas, the Uranographia Sive Astrorum Descriptio. Now, what you need to know is that this atlas listed not 1,000, not 3,000, but 17,240 stars. It included thousands and thousands more than any other atlas. It included 2,500 nebulae that had been cataloged by William Herschel. And the star maps that were depicted here in this atlas included more than 100 constellations, actually, many of which, in which had been made and established by Bode himself. This was an incredible step forward in terms of the knowledge of, of the heavens, of, of planetary bodies. And as often happens, in, on the heels of great innovation comes, come acts of entrepreneurship, right? Um, so one of the men who was inspired by Bode's work was Alexander Jameson. He was a Scotsman and a member of the Astronomical Society of London. And he published a celestial act in 1822. You can see the title of it um, on your screen. Jameson's atlas had far fewer stars than Bode's work. It only had those that were visible to the naked eye, right? So his, his work was trained at, at the masses rather than at the scientific community. And this had the advantage of making his work, which you see on the left of your screen, seem a lot less cluttered. The book was popular, wildly popular, and it had the honor of being allowed to be dedicated to King George IV. You can see here, um, I've opposed his work with, with Bode's um, Northern Celestial Hemisphere. So you can see the different ways that they're using constellations to organize the stars. But it's individual sheets like this one that help explain why his work which was much less comprehensive than that of Bode, sold like hotcakes in the 18th century, in the early 19th century, right? 
It was common practice at the time in celestial atlases that new constellations were included, not because they actually existed, but um, simply to please patrons or to fill in gaps on the page, right? So the example that you see on this sheet um, is an owl, the owl Noctua, um, perched at the end of the tail of Hydra, the water snake. It turns out that this constellation was invented purely to satisfy, um, to, to delight a patron. Um, and other atlas producers included Noctua in their atlases, sometimes in the shape of a dodo, sometimes in the shape of a mockingbird. But by the 1850s, apparently that particular patron um, had lost interest because this area of the night sky lost its avian identity completely and was incorporated just into the constellation Hydra. Noctua disappeared, right? To me, one of the most interesting twists on the influence that Boda had, and these really these three great star cartographers had on the rest of, of the world, the astronomical kind of community, was that it, it influence extended all the way to Russia, right? This atlas was published in St. Petersburg in 1829. Um, and it includes by a man named Cornelius Reisig, who is um, a Baltic German of some kind. We know very little about him, um, but his atlas, includes 28 sheets that look like this. They show the constellations in detail, both as stars and as images of animals. The images are in gold on a black background with small holes punched out so that you can see the magnitude of the stars. There's actually transparent paper that's affixed to the backside of each page so that light can shine through and you can get a sense of looking at the night sky. So you're looking at the constellation Perseus um, here on this page. This is the constellation Taurus, again from the same atlas. And here is his Ursa Major, uh, the great bear. Now this particular constellation had been cataloged by Ptolemy back in the second century. Right? And it's shown here with a nebula that had been identified by Herschel and Bode in his catalog. So you begin to see the way that these bits of knowledge are layered on top of one another and transformed in their material um, and their circulation and distributed across uh, European and Eurasian space. So there was, it was, this was very you know, innovative in, materi in its material design, but it marked the end of an era. The ability to see a growing number of stars through telescopes rendered the constellation format obsolete. By the middle of the 19th century, the most comprehensive catalog of stars had gone from 17,000 to listing over 324,000 stars. There was simply no room anymore for bears or bulls or dragons. And there was another problem as well. Suddenly, identifiable features, not just new stars, but features on planets and moons were being given names. Right? They're being identified, seen, and named, which, was, which is great, but there was no coherent system for doing so. There were ast astronomers all over Europe, each operating according to their own logic. So by the early 1900s, many of the very prominent features on the moon were known by at least three different names. This was toponymical chaos, right? This was data overload in the worst way. What was to be done? Something had to be done. And as you can imagine, the one thing that generally happens is that a committee is formed. And that is exactly what happened. A committee is formed in 1907. And don't worry, I won't give you a long bureaucratic history. But in 1907, the Committee on Lunar Nomenclature came into existence. And in 1919, the International Astronomical Union was established. And it was charged with ironing out the problem of what and how to name things in space. It took them a couple of decades, but by 1935, they had kind of sorted out the moon. Um, and that made people happy for a while until 1957, when the age of space exploration kicked into high gear with Sputnik. And then the Soviet Union and the United States um, going back to back with their missions to the moon, Every time it happened, additional features were discovered. They ended up with contested and duplicated names. And again, it was data overload and toponymical. 
And so now we have, don't worry, this is the end of the kind of bureaucratic history bit, but now we have something called the um, Gazetteer of Planetary Nomenclature that is managed by the International Astronomical Union. And um, this group has representatives from over 14 nations, and they are in charge of the 15,433 named features that are out there on planetary bodies that we have identified and named in space, right? This includes moons, asteroids, planets, you name it. It contains topographic features, albedo features, um, and they have the final say on who, what gets named what. So let's just take a look at how those names have. What are the names that are written in the stars and on the planets? Let's, let's actually just start with Mercury. Places on planet Mercury are named after, excuse me, I have to adjust my screen. Are, <laughs> I've blocked my, my slide. Um, are named after um, the words for snake, right? And hot. Um, all kinds of uh, ships of discovery and radio telescope facilities. Venus, you might already be aware, is named after all manner of goddesses, right? Goddesses of earth and sky and water and beauty. Venus is distinctly gendered terrain. Um, Jupiter. Jupiter is home to volcano gods, places from Dante's Inferno, Celtic gods, um, gods and heroes from the Fertile Crescent, um, from the far north, right? Very distinctive kind of toponymy. Saturn is homeland to stories of King Arthur. Places are named after the Arabian Nights, Homer's Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid, and even Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. On Uranus, places are named after mischievous spirits and characters from Shakespeare. And on Neptune, we have water spirits and aquatic names, which is great. That leaves Mars. Mars is different. Mars has 1,965 named features, and about two-thirds of them are craters. Martian place names are tethered to the Earth in a way that features on other celestial bodies just are not. If you look at this table, which is taken from that Gazetteer of Planetary Names, and it tells you what kinds of things are named on Mars on the left, and then where those names come from on the column on the right, you'll see that the first entry and the last entry both name men named Schiaparelli and Antoniado, Ant Antoniadi. And you might wanna ask yourself, who were these guys? And why do they have such outsized influence on Martian place names? Well, asked because Giovanni Schiaparelli was an Italian astronomer who was educated in Torino, in Turin, and spent most of his career working in Milan. He made innumer innumerable telescopic observations of Mars. Mars was kind of his pet project. He was the one who named the planets seas. He called them seas and continents. When he looked at the surface of Mars, he saw bays. He used the terminology that we're familiar with, bay, lake, swamp, cape, strait. And he took names from old maps and from mythology. And during the planet's great opposition in 1877, he observed a dense network of linear structures on the surface of Mars. He called them canali in Italian, meaning channels. But the term was mistranslated into English as canals. And from that incorrect translation, various assumptions were made about life on Mars. And these assumptions were popularized. And the canals of Mars, a canal being something that's a, a made feature, right, a built feature, a non-naturally occurring. Yeah, they became famous, giving rise to waves of hypotheses and speculation and folklore about the possibility of intelligent life on Mars and about Martians, right? So the birth of a great scientific fiction comes out of the mind of Giovanni Schiaparelli. Now, in the 1960s, NASA's Mariner 4 mission put an end to the idea that there were any canals on the surface of Mars, and Mariner 9 photographed the whole surface of the planet and showed that this was something that had just been, this was a trick of the eye, right, that had been played. And yet, the names that Schiaparelli gave to the surface of Mars, the names that you see on this map by his 
partner, Eugene Antonia Antoniadi, who was an interesting guy himself. That's him in the names that they used still exist. The names he gave to the surface, surface of Mars remain. In fact, there's even a crater named after him. That's all well and good, except that the beautiful array of, of Grecian toponyms, if you look at your screen, you'll see them there, the, um, the Hellas, Elysium, right? Um, Arcadia, Amazonas, they're all there, this beautiful Grecian topography, uh, toponymy. It really wasn't Schiaparelli's idea at all. No. His name is the one in the Gazetteer of Planetary Names, but Schiaparelli, it turns out, took a trip to Russia in 1859, and he spent a year there at the Polkova Observatory. Now, you may or may not know this, but in the middle of the 19th century, the Polkova Observatory outside of St. Petersburg was the premier astronomical observatory of the day. Schiaparelli developed a very close working relationship with the director, a man named Otto Vasilievich Struve. Now, Struve was a major force in the field of stellar astronomy. He discovered 500 binary stars. He represented the nature of the rings of Saturn. He was the director of the observatory, and he followed in the steps, footsteps of his father, who had actually founded the observatory. In 1850, he was awarded a gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society, and he's pictured here with his observatory staff. Struve and Schiaparelli corresponded for decades after Schiaparelli went on. And in 1877, when Mars was in opposition and could therefore be observed more closely from Earth than at any other time, um, the two discussed how to name the things that they were seeing. And in a letter written in November of 1877, Struve said this, to use simply numbers and letters would be insufficient since they make less impression on the memory and names. He went on, there are already sufficient gods, goddesses, and demigods in the heavens. Would you not like, if you would permit me to propose it, to have Greek philosophers, or since we're talking about Mars, Greek and Trojan heroes from the Iliad, the Greeks, since they lived on ships, could be placed on the seas, and the heroes of Troy on the supposed firm ground. Struve Schiaparelli replied in January, just two months later, that he had taken Struve's advice. In other words, Mars is full of Grecian place names because of a beautiful friendship, professional friendship, that spanned the distance between the Mediterranean and the Baltic Sea. So here's a map made in 1970 of Martian place names. And as you can see, I wasn't lying to you, right? All of those Grecian place names are still there. Amazonas, Hellas, sorry, Amazonas, Elysium, Arcadia, right? Now, if you are observing Mars from Earth, the albedo features are still what you see. So an albedo feature is just something, something that you see because of differences in light and dark. They're not actually topographical features on the surface. So the traditional names for those features are still in place. But since the 1970s, and particularly over the past decade, landers and orbiters have radically altered our understanding of the surface because we can see so much more now. The old list of 100 or so place names had to be supplemented. There are over 1,000 craters on Mars alone. So the question becomes, where should the names come from? And here's where they come from. Back to our gazetteer of planetary uh, names. Small craters, in particular, are named after small towns and villages of the world with populations of approximately 100,000 people or less. This is great. This category is simply a large source of crater names. No commemoration of specific towns or villages is intended. Right. So the meaning here is that this naming practice is meant to be purely objective. Don't get any fancy ideas if your small village is chosen to name a crater on the surface of Mars. So where do the names come from? Well, Brush, Colorado, Campos, Brazil, Chamba, India, Falun, Sweden, Ganjazi, uh, Georgia, Littleton, Maine. You get the idea. Now, because I'm a Russianist, I'm going to show you the list of 
Russian places um, that are now small craters on the Martian surface. There are a lot of them, a lot of small towns in the Russian Federation. And in order to make this a little bit more kind of spatial in nature, I threw those places on a map just so that you could see where they come from. And I, there are a couple, a handful that come from places adjacent to the Russian Federation. And you'll see in the lower left corner, the, the southwest corner of the map, there's a black place mark. It, make, it marks a place called Yezera in Bosnia Herzegovina. Right, the start of NASA's latest search for evidence of ancient microbial life on Mars begins there. And in fact, NASA's decision to land, to, to name the landing site after Yezera was actually assumed by locals to be a joke. The name was chosen from 80 suggestions. And the reason given by NASA is that many in many Slavic languages, Yezera describes a natural depression or a depression filled with water. It comes from the Proto-Slavic Yezera, which in Russian you hear as Ozera, and in Bosnian Yezera. In English, lake, right? So there it is, the Proto-Slavic Lake, Bosnian village, Martian crater. All of this leads to a question. What are we trying to see on the Martian surface? What does the strategy of assigning place names tell us about our relationship to near planetary space or about power relations here on Earth? Are these humble, small towns collected from obscure corners of the globe, the new equivalent of the sinuous Roman constellations? Right? We aren't creating new constellations, but perhaps we have found a way, actually, to inscribe the significance of the small, intimate spaces of human experience into the heavens. I think in the end, the story of the Yezera crater tells us this. Our methods of making sense of the universe are shaped by our need to establish relationships, by our deeply spatial ways of thinking, and by the fact that in the end, Aristotle was right. Location matters always and everywhere, even in the stars. Thank you so much, Kelly. This was so neat and actually very special for me. I grew up learning about the constellations from my dad in the backyard. Um, however, you have provided a much clearer um, celestial map for me. So thank you so much. Um, I would love to invite our viewers to send your questions to the Q&A box. Um, we already have started a long list. So please continue to send your questions there. Um, I will begin with um, I will begin with this question, Kelly. You mentioned earlier, uh, very early on in your presentation, that you make maps. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, what is the process? Do you happen to have a map that you could show us? Sure, sure. Yeah, um, I think I kind of lived in fear that you'd pick up on that. But um, so I, I am a historian, right? I'm not a trained geographer. I'm not a trained cartographer. Um, and so what I would say is that I am more actually of a mapper than a map maker. And let me show you an example. Um, what I mean by that is that I am fascinated and almost can't live without the process of spatial analysis, of, of kind of working in an environment where I can establish the relationships between things. Um, but I will show you a couple of maps because I have decided to be brave. Um, I've been at this for a long time. And for the last couple of years, there's an incredible Finnish geospatial um, kind of expert who throws a challenge out to anyone who wants to um, in the world to participate in something called the 30 day map challenge. And it's oh on Twitter. Gosh. And so he gives a list oh. every day in November from day one until November 1st until November 30th, there's a theme and your challenge to create a map that corresponds to that theme. So I decided this year I would take a crack at it. I'm already about five days behind, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to catch up by, by the end. And I can show you a couple of the things that um, I've tried to put together just to kind of give you a sense of um, how I map and, and why I think it's, it's useful. So this is an example 
um, you are looking essentially at kind of Western Eurasia. There is an um, or European Russia. This map is describing the boundaries of the Russian Empire in the early 19th century. We, and what, oh, Kelly, no, I was just going to say, we can actually see all of the maps, but I think you're highlighting. Oh, you're I highlighting am. One right now. <clears throat> Hang on, let me try to share the right thing. This is always the tricky bit, isn't it? Let's see if this, tell me if you can see the blue map now. Perfect, yeah. Yay, okay, great. Um, so European Russia, right, Western Eurasia, and you see a whole lot of blue. And what I decided to do, and you see lots of little thin yellow lines. Those thin yellow lines actually show you where all of the rivers were um, on this amazing atlas of the Russian empire. And everything that's blue, if, if it's colored in blue, it's more than a kilometer away from a river. Meaning that this is me thinking, how far could I stand to walk carrying buckets of water, right? From a river to, to get to, a, you know, to my home. And so the blue areas are the, the thirsty areas, the areas that, um, that are in need of water. And I just kind of inverted the color scheme to kind of think about um, what all of this might look like. This is um, one other map I can show you. Oh, wow. Even though it looks like just a collection of maps, I swear it's actually a, a meta map. <laughs> um, the theme for this day was, was hexagons. And when I heard mm -hmm. the word hexagon, I, my mind immediately went to military fortresses. Um, which, and I thought to myself, okay, I, I wonder, there must have been some hexagonal fortresses in the Russian Empire. So there, believe it or not, is an atlas of fortresses of the Russian Empire. So I pulled out my trusty atlas and I went through all 60 of the, the fortresses that are pictured there. And they're gorgeous, gorgeous. You know, the maps are beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I excerpted them. And I found out that only two are actually truly hexagonal and the rest are either pentagons or weird amoeba-like blobs. Um, but the interesting thing about this, this is a mapping of the fortresses because um, the maps you see in the north, in the upper left corner are in the northwest of the empire. They kind, it's kind of a schematic mapping of where the fortresses sit on the space of, of um, the empire from the Baltic all the way to Siberia. So mapping can mean so many things to so many people. It can be a highly technological, technical process. It can involve tracing paper and colored pencils um, which is something I do with my students. Um, but the, to me, it's really, it's the process of kind of thinking about a spatial question and pulling material together and data together. Um, sometimes the end product isn't exactly the right thing, but that process of thinking spatially is really, really fascinating and yeah. productive. Thank you. Um, the, and that map is just so beautiful. Uh, we have a great question from Timothy. Um, he has asked, did Ptolemy conceive and create the outlines and names of his original 48 constellations, or did he simply compile the previous work of others and publish them in a book? <laughs> Which is such a great way to get credit for things, right? Right, um, <laughs> right so he, um, it's, it's relatively well known that he cribbed most of his data, but I, I'm saying cribbed, which me, makes it sound like I'm judging Ptolemy. No, this is kind of a standard practice. Um, he pulled from Hipparchus, who was a Babylonian who preceded him by several hundred years. Um, so a lot of the data that he used to, um, to articulate the constellations had been produced by others before him. Mm -hmm. What was so unique about Ptolemy was that he came up with this incredibly systematic and highly accurate way of organizing that information. And it was regarded as really, really accurate. There are incredible debates now about what kinds of manipulations he made. Um, Hipparchus's data came from um, quite a while earlier than him. The, the heavens are not stable. They're always moving. So he had to make some adjustments sure. and manipulations. Um, so the ideas of accuracy are kind of fraught. Um, I don't want to take a lot away from Ptolemy. I mean, he really, he accomplished something amazing, but I, the question is well taken and yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, this next question is from Jerry and he said, he asked, did early non-Western cultures such as the Chinese create celestial maps? Um, they they def definitely did. Um, we, I, to be perfectly honest, I know very little about the Chinese maps in particular. I know that their schemes for organizing um, stars into constellations were based on elements of the earth, um, water and soil and things like that. 
we have, um, I know a little bit more about, there were incredibly different practices um, throughout the, the African tribes um, and uh, throughout Central America, South America, we know a fair amount about how the Aztecs and the Maya thought about, um, about the heavens. And one of the interesting things is, of course, they don't use the Greek and Roman, you know, mythological features, you know, to, to organize the heavens. They generally have a through line, a common through line that associates um, the stars in the sky to the agricultural cycle. So, um, and, you know, some of them have really, really wonderful kind of stories that go along with, with them. Um, like the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, um, mm -hmm. we think of as the Pleiades, they're called the digging stars in a lot of the African tribes because when you see them appear, you know, you, it was time to start the harvest. And Oh, sure, um, yeah. Yeah, so that's naming practices. They also did produce um, ways of representing all of this information in graphic forms. Um, and there's a lot of scholarly debate about almost all of these artifacts, whether they're actually meant to be seen as representations of astronomical thinking mm -hmm. or something that's more, more folkloric, right? And I think there's a kind of a sure. scholarly assumption that these things need to be separated and perhaps, perhaps they really shouldn't be. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. I think this question actually came in um, when you were sharing your maps. So what software products do you use to create your maps? Mm. Um, so I am a bit of a hypocrite because I am a firm <laughs> believer in open source data and open source technology. And to the extent that I am able, um, I do that. However, for most of the map work that I do, I use Esri products. I use Arc Pro. Um, I used to use Arc Map, but now I use Arc Pro. Um, I try um, to produce my data. I mean, data gets produced in lots of interoperable, exportable forms, GeoJSON and all that. Um, but I, I do tend to stick to um, the software that is kind of the equivalent. If you're not, if you're not a mapper yourself, I can explain it this way. Esri products. Um, yes, I do use some KML. Thank you, John. <laughs> yep, <laughs> I do. Um, the data format more than the software, but yes. Um, Esri is kind of like the Google of the mapping world. They kind of have this like dominant position around the world and they make all kinds of scary slash exciting claims about the power of maps to rule the world. And they make the oh. software that enables people to, you know. So it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit much, but their software is great. And there's a lot of wonderful open source software out there as well that you don't need a license for. So I, I kind of yeah. take advantage of Harvard's, you know, um, licensed resources, which makes scholarly work easier. Of course. Well, thank you for sharing. I, I think we have some map makers in the audience. Um, so this next question, what is the nomenclature for all the new exoplanets found orbiting around close stars? Ooh, my. Um, so there are that, okay. So I will say, I'm not exactly sure what particular nomenclature is being used for them, but the process that for, for any new um, nomenclature is the same. So everything gets, um, there's kind of a um, temporary practice, naming practice um, by the people who are like, for example, NASA will develop a nomenclature that they like and they, they use informally. And then it has to go through a formalization um, process at the International Astronomical Union. And there are, very, there are a number of steps along the way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so glad you asked that question because now I'm going to have to find out exactly what, what that nomenclature is. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Certainly. Um, so our next question, um, and this is from Hugh, how, how much does celestial cartography take from the Polynesians who navigated the Pacific Ocean? Mm. Thank you, Hugh. Um, this is, it's a really interesting <clears throat> question because in a way it's very specific. And in a way, it gets at a much bigger question about how we know the things we know and what is the dividing line between practice, um, people out there in the world, sailing from place to place, collecting knowledge, right? Um, and then the way that that knowledge is often harvested and standardized and instrumentalized or mobilized, right, for different purposes. Um, so this is this particular this kind of question, whether it's Polynesian navigators, Portuguese navigators, um, you know, African navigators, even within the Mediterranean, um, where early Portalon charts are some of the most authoritative and there was prevalent um, data about how you sail along the Mediterranean. 
Um, none of those things could have been produced without local, um, without local knowledge, right? Without local practice. Right. Um, and all of those names and all of those little small bits of data fall away in the process of creating a map that can be distributed and circulated in large quantities. And so the, there's a really interesting tension between the richness that goes into the production of the information in a map and, and then that reductive quality of like losing all of those little those bits and pieces. Um, so it's, it's a really big and interesting and important, important question to ask every time you encounter a map. Who is involved? What voices can't you see anymore? Right. What, what's getting left out of the map that you're holding in your hands or touching on the screen? It's just yeah, certainly. an incredibly important question. Mm -hmm. uh, so to our next question, how, how do you explain the apparent appearance of Antarctica in the world map of 1513 by photographer Piri Reese? Ah, well, so Piri Reese was a, a map maker, a cartographer, but first and foremost, an admiral in the Ottoman Navy. And the Ottoman Empire had an incredibly powerful Navy um, in the 16th century. So we're talking about 1515. So just to put it in perspective, um, the fall of Constantinople happened in 1453. Right, world historical event. Um, the, Byzant the Byzantine Emperor ceases, Empire ceases to exist. The Ottomans are installed in Istanbul, Constantinople. 1492, you have the voyages of Columbus, right? So, and then 20 years later, this, this map is made. So it's kind of falling, falling on the heels of some really important global events. Um, the map itself, there's a major debate about where the information for the map really came from and what. It actually depicts. Um, Pyrrhus himself um, claimed that his information came primarily from Ptolemy's maps, and a lot of the um, Ptolemy's catalogs were lost for a long time and then finally recuperated and started being printed and used to make maps. We don't have any original maps by Ptolemy. Mm -hmm. But by the time Pyrrhus was making his maps, Ptolemy's information was in circulation. But he also drew on the work of Columbus and he drew on other um, Portuguese. Um, sources. And so people had this idea that perhaps there had been a voyage or perhaps people knew more about Antarctica than we could, we've could we ever known was possible because it appears on this map from 1513 mm -hmm. that they knew all about Antarctica. And probably, I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful, exciting idea. Probably mm -hmm. the truth is that there was a traditional sense in the Ptolemaic world that the North was balanced by the South. And knew a lot of about the land masses in the North and assumed there had to be something in the South. And there was a traditional understanding that there was land there, even though no one had substantiated it. And it's not going to be for another couple of decades or hundred years before, and really the Cook expeditions, right? In the 1750s, where people start um, kind of starting to learn about the coasts of Antarctica and they're not properly mapped until the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, like Piri Reis was a, certainly a cartographer ahead of his time and created gorgeous, gorgeous maps, but probably didn't know for sure yeah. the size and shape of Antarctica. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so another question here, are you able to tell us about the constellations on the walls of the Lascaux Caves in France? Mm. So this kind of touches back on that, that um, kind of question about more traditional um, non-scientific representations of the heavens and whether or not they should be seen and can be seen as authoritative. So these Lascaux caves um, in France, they were, um, the caves I think were discovered in about 1940. And I think it was kids were out um, with their dogs or their goats or something like that and yep. stumbled upon these caves, right? Um, and the there, there's one particular hall that where the wall is filled with, with animals, and there's a very particular, very famous representation of a bull, which um, has led to theories that um, it's actually Taurus, right? So th this is not just a bull, this is actually a representation of, of, the, of the constellation in the, in the sky. So scientists have used some really interesting software actually to, to run analyses of um, the angles and trying to kind of work back and think about what the night sky looked like um, when these uh, drawings were made 40,000 years ago in the, the Paleolithic, Paleolithic period. Um, and again, 
it's 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 debated and no one I think can know for sure. Um, but it certainly seems to be the case that there are enough bits and pieces of evidence from Turkey and France and Spain and Germany and you know throughout Asia Minor, throughout China, um, that astronomical knowledge um, was part of daily life much earlier than than we might have have thought, much earlier than Ptolemy. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. And it looks like we, we have time for one last question. Um, and I'd like to end with this one. I know you have shared so much information on celestial maps, but I'm sure you deal with a lot of other maps. Can you tell us about one of your favorite maps from the Russian Empire? Sure, sure. I would love to. Um, let's see. And maybe if I'm able to click on the right thing, I can even share it. I oh, think, great. Uh, yeah, I, I, I look at it almost all the time. So um, do you do you see yes. that? Okay, great. So Fabulous. this this is a beautiful and horrible map. I mean, this map torments <laughs> me. Um, it was made in 1696, and it's a map of a stretch of a river in Siberia, the Irtish River in Siberia. It's made by, it was commissioned by Peter the Great. It's our Peter the Great who He's relatively famous for doing all kinds of interesting things. And he commissioned a map of Siberia. And um, there was only essentially one man in the entire Russian empire capable of creating it. And he created this map. It has about 168 sheets of rivers. Um, and we actually have it right here at Houghton Library at Harvard. Um, there's only one copy. We have it for all kinds of interesting reasons. Oh my um, God. It's been digitized and it's gorgeous to look at. You can see the rivers, you can see the representation of the forests. If you, if you look closely, you can see these little kind of orange lines. Those are caravan routes. Um, the squares denote places where Russian settlers lived and they're usually nothing more than two or three fishing huts. Um, and where you see little dots, those are places where non-Russians um, lived. And what I love about this particular sheet is there's this little pencil scr um, scribbling here that if you, you know, oh, yeah. make out and it, it says Yermak, it's the name of, of a guy, it's the name of, of a Cossack who um, was sent out in the 16th century to participate in the conquest of Siberia. And he did a really great job. Um, he, he brought the Cossacks across the rivers, you know, he was bringing Russian power. <laughs> if you're a Muscovite, you were cheering him on. And he was he was commissioned to do this by Ivan the Terrible, Ivan Grozny. And Ivan gave him a gift to thank him. He gave him a suit of armor and um, like chain mail kind of thing. And so Yermak brought that back with him when he went back out um, to push further. And he got into a battle with some of the local um, Tatars there on a riverbank. And he was kind of pushed back along the bank and he actually fell down the riverbank and he was wearing his chain mail and it weighed him down. Oh my goodness. Um, and he drowned and died. Oh. And, um, and it, this map is fabulous because it says Yermak because his burial place is actually right where that little cross is in kind oh, of wow. the middle of your screen. That's supposedly the spot where Yermak was buried by his men. And they say that um, to this day, if you're there at the right time at dusk or twilight, you, you know, there'll be kind of um, vapors emanating from, from his oh grave. Oh my goodness. Uh, so it's just a really narr like lovely narrative moment on a map that doesn't seem to be about anything other than trees. And yeah, <laughs> that is so interesting. And it lives at Harvard. How, how it lives at Harvard. is that? Yep. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. This was truly amazing. On behalf of the Harvard travel team and our alumni community, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. As soon as you close out of this webinar, a brief survey will appear and we hope that you'll take a moment to complete it. And as a reminder, the recording of this lecture will be shared with you. Um, you'll see on your screen that Kelly is scheduled to lead a cruise for the Harvard Travel Program next year, Black Sea Circumnavigation on Island Sky from September 22nd to October 3rd, 2022. If you'd like to check out more information on the trip, I encourage you to click on the link that you can find in the chat. And finally, I hope that you will join our last travel talk of the calendar year, The Snakes That Bind, Excavating a Magical Amulet in Turkey, featuring Francis Gellert Marquez. Uh, you can also find the registration link in the chat.
Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.